Hello again. You've probably already watched a few videos dealing with the energy demands of cells or the energy production processes of cells. And one of the things we want to realize is that most of the chemical reactions that occur within cells don't occur very well or very efficiently at the energy level of one of your normal cells, about 37 degrees Celsius. If I could heat up your cells to 100 degrees Celsius, all the chemical reactions would occur at about the same speed they occur now. But you can see that that wouldn't be a very beneficial temperature to keep your cells at. You already would say, uh, probably, oh, my proteins have become denatured at that kind of temperature. So cells need to find some mechanism of reducing the amount of energy required for chemical reactions to take place. This is where enzymes are going to come into play. And so we want to, first of all, take a look at what are some of the structural features and a brief discussion of the functional features of enzymes. Let's take a look at them. Enzymes are composed of protein, right? They're going, that's going to be the basic component of all enzymes. But you might see the term holoenzyme used to imply that we're talking about a protein plus some additional material. The protein part of the enzyme is called the apoenzyme. The additional material, the non-protein material, is called a cofactor. So apoenzyme is the protein portion, and the non-protein portion is called a cofactor. Now, these uh, cofactors come in a variety of different forms, and they're going to bind to the protein. And you could think of it as, by binding to the protein, they complete its shape. They finish the structure of the enzyme so that it can have its correct form and, therefore, its correct function. We're going to find that there's lots of different kinds of cofactors. And as a matter of fact, many of the things that we refer to as vitamins are used primarily in cells as cofactors for enzymes. There can be inorganic cofactors. And if I have an inorganic cofactor, I'm talking about something typically that's going to be some kind of metal ion. Might be zinc or iron or magnesium. And we're going to find a number of proteins, a number of enzymes, that have these inorganic cofactors bound to the protein part of the enzyme. But there can also be organic cofactors. Now, organic cofactors are going to have to what? Fall into one of the categories of lipid or nucleic acid, nucleotide, or some kind of carbohydrate. And they can come in a variety of different forms as well. We do make one subdivision in terms of the organic cofactors. If an organic cofactor binds for just a short period of time to the enzyme, then we refer to it as a coenzyme. If, on the other hand, the organic cofactor binds permanently to the enzyme and becomes a consistent part of the enzyme structure, then typically you'll see people use the terminology of a prosthetic group. You won't have to make that distinction when you look at the structure of enzymes, but you do want to be aware that there are these two classes of organic cofactors. What do enzymes do? Well, enzymes speed up cells' chemical reactions. And how do they do that? Well, think about my introductory comments. They do it by lowering the amount of energy required for a particular reaction or process to take place. So when we talked about chemical reactions before, we talked about how all chemical reactions start off with some kind of input of energy, whether they're exergonic or energonic. And there's a, you could think of it as an energy barrier energy must be absorbed by the chemicals that are going to go through the reaction before they can initiate that chemical reaction. That energy that's needed to start off the chemical reaction, remember, is called activation energy or energy of activation. That push start, that energy added to the molecules to start them in the process of reacting. Well, as I said, you can think of this as being a hurdle or a barrier that the chemicals have to get over to be able to go through their chemical reaction. So pictorially, we might think of it this way. You can see that in the first illustration, the reactants have a certain amount of energy, but very few of them have enough energy to get over the energy barrier created or needed to stimulate, trigger the chemical reaction to take place. What do enzymes do? Well, in essence, what they do is they decrease the size of that barrier. They lower the energy of activation required for the reactants to react. How might they do that? Well, let me give you an example. Let's say I'm an enzyme that's going to help two substances that are attached by a covalent bond break that covalent bond. Well, if that substance attaches to me as an enzyme and I can 
pull on them or twist them or stretch that covalent bond. In other words, if by me grabbing a hold of that reactant, I can stress or put energy into that bond, then it's going to take less energy for that bond to break. I'm going to facilitate the breakage of that bond. By the way, enzymes also facilitate the construction of bonds. So you don't want to think of them as just molecules that are breaking things down. We want to see them as molecules that get involved in all the different kinds of chemical reactions. Matter of fact, you could argue that every chemical reaction in your cells is either directly or indirectly controlled by some enzyme. That's an enormous number of enzymes, isn't it? An enormous number of functions that are occurring. We're talking about tens of thousands of different kinds of chemical reactions in a cell, each being facilitated by a particular enzyme. Now, enzymes' names today are structured in such a way so that you're going to be able to recognize something about the enzyme's job or something about the enzyme's substrate or in some cases something about the enzyme's product as part of its name. So notice that we have enzymes that are called oxidoreductases and guess what they do? They help oxidation reduction reactions. We have hydrolases and as their name implies they help hydrolysis reactions. We have some enzymes that are named based upon the kind of substrate they work with. So we might have an enzyme called a peptidase. You can see what its substrate is, peptide bonds and proteins, or a protease. And both of these names are implying that this is an enzyme that in some way works with some kind of protein. Also, we see enzymes that are named based upon what the product is that they're associated with. So we're going to see an enzyme called ATP synthetase or sometimes just called ATP synthase. And this is an enzyme that's going to be involved in synthesizing, building ATPs. So you can see the names of enzymes commonly are associated with their function or their reactants, and in some cases, their products. Usually the name gives us some kind of indication of what they do. Now, note all of those names I gave you in the previous illustration we're ending in ASE, and that is the common way to name enzymes. Any new enzymes that are discovered today are given that ASE ending. Well, as you might expect, there are some exceptions to this, especially for enzymes that were named prior to us agreeing that we would call everything that is an enzyme, give it an ending of ASE. And so you might run into an enzyme called pepsin, for example, or an enzyme called chymotrypsin. They're perfectly good enzymes. It's just that they were named, they were given this nomenclature prior to the convention of using ASE endings. By the way, both pepsin and chymotrypsin are types of proteases. Okay, so that tells you that they're going to work on some kind of protein substrate, but their names are distinctive more for where they're produced or what organ they function in. And that was a way in which some names were created previous to our ASE ending convention. Now, think about pictorially what's happening. Remember, I had drawn some of these free energy diagrams for you previously in one of the other videos. And what we're saying is that we're representing a relationship between the initial reactants and the final products of a reaction. And in particular, we're looking at them in reference to their energy level. Notice here we're showing an exergonic reaction, reaction in which the products produced have less energy stored in them than the reactants that started. Remember, if, you, if you, that doesn't sound familiar to you, go back and review the ideas of exergonic and endergonic. But look at the key feature that we're seeing here in this illustration. We're looking at a difference of the energy of activation without an enzyme present versus the energy of activation with an enzyme present. Key feature to note here, the reactants and the products start out and end at the same location. There's no change in what occurs in the chemical reaction. The change that does occur is how much energy it takes for the reaction to take place. As a result, we say that the enzyme facilitates a chemical reaction We'd never want to say that an enzyme causes a chemical reaction. All enzymes can do is help chemical reactions occur. 
that could occur normally but allow them to occur at a lower energy level. All right, so notice this free energy diagram. Look at the difference between the black and the red lines. See the effect of the enzyme. It hasn't changed our beginning or ending point, just the barrier, the energy barrier we have to get over to be able to react. Okay? Now, enzymes have a key feature, which is that they're selective, or they have what's called specificity. Typically, each enzyme only has one particular chemical reaction it works with, only one particular substrate that it functions with, one particular chemical that it works with. So the selectivity, the specificity of enzymes, determines which chemical reactions are occurring in which parts of the cell and at what speeds. That selectivity, the specificity of the enzyme, is determined by how the substrate molecule that it works with fits into the active site of the enzyme. It's a structural, a three-dimensional fit that occurs. And so we talk about the conformation, that's another word for the shape, the shape of an enzyme, in particular the shape of its active site, and the shape of the substrate molecule it interacts with. All right? Also realize that if we talk about an enzyme interacting with a substrate and fitting together, it's not just due to shape. That's an important feature. But it's also due to the fact that these two things have to be able to attach to each other. So there has to be some degree of complementary chemical bonding that takes place as well. So enzyme specificity. One enzyme, typically, for each substrate. What determines that specificity? Shape. The shape fit, the conformational fit, between the shape of the enzyme and the shape and chemical properties of the substrate. So look at this representation to give you some idea about this idea of shape. Here we have an enzyme, an apoenzyme in this case, and this illustration shows how a coenzyme might be involved, an organic cofactor, might be involved in the enzyme's shape. Notice over here to the right-hand side of the illustration, we have the holoenzyme, the completed enzyme, the protein part plus the coenzyme, and you can see that it creates a specific three-dimensional pocket called the active site that the substrate attaches to. By the way, notice how the coenzyme is shown in this illustration as helping to complete the active site of the enzyme. And that's one of the most common jobs we see for coenzymes. Also remember that these coenzymes only bind for a short period of time and then let go. Just attach during the chemical reaction they're helping, and then they typically let go again very shortly after that. We can go through a cycle of how a chemical reaction might be facilitated by an enzyme by taking a look at this illustration. There's our enzyme. In this place, we're looking at an enzyme called a sucrase. That means that it uses as its substrate molecule the sugar sucrose. You can see sucrose, the substrate. You can see that it's represented as having a shape that's going to be able to fit into the active site of the enzyme. The substrate molecule binds to the active site of the enzyme. The enzyme is going to wrap itself right around that substrate molecule. So we say that it is induced to fit the substrate molecule. I like to think of that as the substrate coming into the active site and then the active site wrapping itself around the substrate. Now, the enzyme can facilitate the chemical reaction to take place, in this case, a hydrolysis reaction in which we're going to break the bond, the glycosidic linkage between these two sugars. And then finally, you can see that we're going to have the enzyme releasing the products from its active site and as is implied, the enzyme is ready to go back and do this process again. So notice, even though the enzyme was changing shape during the chemical reaction, the enzyme returns to its original form and shape after the reaction has been facilitated. So that means that enzymes can be used over and over and over again. They're not one-use kinds of structures. Again, make note of what I said. They may change in structure during facilitating the chemical reaction, but when they're finished helping that chemical reaction take place, the enzyme returns to its original shape and form, ready to be used again. Well, how fast can they do this? Enzymes can function at what to me are enormous speeds, unimaginable speeds. Some very slow enzymes can only do that cycle, binding to their substrate, helping it 
release the products back to their original shape once every second. You might think of that as being pretty fast, but there are some enzymes that, or let's say the most typical enzymes, can do this about 10,000 times a second. And there are even some exceptional enzymes that can carry out this process hundreds of thousands of times a second. Now to me that's mind-boggling. I can't imagine anything happening hundreds of thousands of times a second, but we know that it occurs because we can actually measure it. We can see it happen. So this cyclical event of an enzyme binding to a substrate, helping it react, release the products back to my original form, is called the turnover rate of an enzyme. And we're saying that some enzymes have turnover rates that are in the hundreds of thousands. That means that some processes are occurring in the cell at enormously fast rates. You can see that that would be the case if enzymes are present. Now there is one other group of catalytic molecules found in cells. Previously we'd only talked about enzymes. But nowadays we're realizing that there are RNA molecules that can fold and twist on themselves, giving them a complex three-dimensional shape, and they can also help some chemical reactions take place. We therefore came up with the term ribozyme to explain or to label these RNA molecules, nucleic acids, that have catalytic function. So don't be surprised if you find more and more reference to ribozymes. As we look for them, we find them in all parts of the cell, having a wide variety of jobs. Another important catalytic molecule found in living systems. All right, so we talked a little bit about structure of enzymes, the protein part and the overall enzyme structure, if there's a cofactor attached to the protein portion. We talked about the kinds of cofactors in organic, organic coenzymes, organic prosthetic groups. Remember we said that the difference between those two organic types was the duration of their bonding, short-term versus long-term. We talked about the idea that these enzymes facilitate chemical reactions due to a shape fit. Make sure you remind yourself of that idea. And then finally, we talked about the idea that there are additional catalytic molecules found in cells. And it's a class of molecules that we call ribozymes. And I also indicated to you that this was a class of molecules that is becoming more and more important in terms of research. We're finding out that there's many more ribozymes than we ever suspected in the first place. Now, we're going to be talking about enzymes frequently this semester, so make sure you feel comfortable with this information before you move on to other discussions of enzymes and their relationship to the chemical reactions of a cell. Thank you very much. Look forward to talking to you next time.